Today, I'm joined by Douglas Gautier AM, the CEO and Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival Centre. Look, thank you, Douglas, for joining us for this Global 20 interview. Uh, can I just start by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and the great work you're doing at the Adelaide Festival Centre? Well, thanks, Lincoln, and thank you for the opportunity of, of speaking with you today. It's much appreciated, and uh, particularly with an organisation that does such great uh, global work in this field. Uh, look, I'm currently the CEO and Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival Centre, which is the major performing arts centre for uh, South Australia. It's a capital city arts centre. There's one in each capital city in Australia. Uh, I came to this job in 2006 after being the director of the Hong Kong Arts Festival and after spending nearly 30 years in Asia, uh, a long time in the private sector with satellite television, uh, but also running a music and arts channel for the government and at one stage being the chief operating officer for the Hong Kong Tourist Board immediately after 1997. Anyway, uh, Coming down here in 2006 uh, to take over this centre, uh, yeah, my, my brief was really to uh, reconnect it internationally and to get it out of debt. It was about uh, close to $30 million in debt and uh, it was a great centre. It was the first capital city arts centre in this country uh, with a lot riding on reputation for this city, which regards itself as the festival capital of our country, pretty much like Edinburgh is to United Kingdom. So there was a lot of work to do in terms of re-establishing or establishing festivals year round. We can talk a bit more about that later on. Um, and to get it out of debt, clearly that was very important. And thirdly, to, to reconnect it uh, internationally, but particularly with a focus on Asia and Asia uh, is where, you know, I had those connections and contacts and I still chair the Asia Pacific Art Centres Association, which is some 60 or 70 centres across Asia Pacific and a whole bunch of uh, um, business associates, uh, you know, suppliers, artists, agents, etc. even philanthropists, how about that? Uh, so uh, that's really uh, what I do. Well, thank you very much. You are eminently qualified to talk today about the arts, particularly how the arts contributes to society. And also we'll touch on um, some of the, uh, the commonalities or differences between what you've seen in the artistic field within Asia and Australia, and also that philanthropic side of, from Asia and Australia. But if I could start first, Douglas, by asking you to outline the role that arts play in building healthier societies. Obviously, during COVID, well, we've had you know, challenges and all of that. But, you know, what, how is, have the arts, you know, the sector, the leadership, the boards, um, you know, helped with people reconnecting post-lockdown? Well, I, I think as we all come out of our, uh, our, um, our homes and uh, hopefully a little bit off online and into the real world, uh, public organisations uh, which bring people together uh, are important, whether it be, you know, universities or shopping malls or, uh, or public spaces, and particularly um, arts centres and uh, museums and galleries, that sort of thing. And so I think uh, it is part and parcel of that rebuilding uh, of of commute, sense of community and uh, well-being. Uh, so I think, I think arts and culture has a very important part to play in that, but I, I would say in a broader, uh, a broader platform, if you like, and this is a personal opinion, but I know a lot of other people share the view, uh, and that is uh, that you know where arts and culture flourish generally, uh, so does harmony and tolerance and better understanding and feel for walking in somebody else's shoes. Yes. And here in yes. Australia, we we are probably one of the most multicultural communities on the planet. Uh, and we are, over the last 20 or 30 years, really strongly re-examined the role of First Nations culture uh, as part of our community, very important part of our community. So in building strong civic society, which uh, you know is, is open and accessible uh, to that wide diversity of cultural uh, backgrounds uh, and views, uh, then 
I think cultural organisations like ours have a special responsibility and have a special uh, task to uh, to make the, those multicultural platforms possible and that interaction uh, possible, diversity and accessibility. So uh, that's how I think we can contribute. And I think more and more, if you look at the best cultural organisations worldwide and art centres worldwide, uh, they're very cognizant of that responsibility and they work very hard uh, to make sure that they contribute in that way. So that, that's excellent. I mean, the, as we know, as you said, the arts are transformative and creating those harmonious, connected, healthier, happier societies. How has philanthropy contributed to that? How does philanthropy support the arts in, in achieving that? Well, you know, to a more or less degree, I mean, if you go right around the world, I mean, there are some places where arts and culture are completely government funded and mm. uh, places where they're not in some places like the states where, of course, there is government involvement, but a, a lot of it is to do with uh, commercial possibilities, uh, yep. plus very heavy degree and tradition uh, of giving. But I'll give you, an, uh, here it's a, you know, Australia is a kind of mixed model, but uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, about two or three years ago, we redeveloped an old Edwardian theatre, which is part of our uh, as a part of our infrastructure portfolio. And it's a, you know, it's a reasonably sized theatre. Uh, it's about 1,500 seats, and we completely redeveloped it. Uh, but government set us a, uh, a target for a contribution uh, from our organisation, which was around about $6 million, uh, which, you know, for a town our size uh, is quite a significant amount. And what was interesting is that uh, to raise that $6 million, and ultimately it was seven, uh, uh, there were over 5,000 donors. So some people gave $5. Yes. And one donor gave over a million. Uh, but it didn't matter because within the community, over 5,000 people said, yes, I want to be part of this and it's important to me. And in a way, that has knit those uh, donors in with our organisation and the the ambition for that theatre, which is which is a good one in terms of saying let's make something which was historic, the last standing of its chain uh, in Australia. Let's make it something that's relevant to uh, uh, audiences of the twentieth century and that artists twenty uh, first century and that artists would also you know w want to work in it. And importantly, that theatre is in. Uh, uh, you know, a fairly multicultural area uh, in our city. Uh, it, it's Chinatown, but it's also a place where foreign students congregate. So uh, it ticks a lot of boxes in that regard. But mainly, I think what it has done, it has brought a community together in something that they that they collectively can own, and they feel that it is something that will make our community better. Hmm. And has that have you seen a change in the philanthropic support to the arts because of that? I mean, that was a, a major capital campaign that was undertaken. Has has that um, cannibalised anything in terms of regular giving uh, to the arts? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's grown the pie, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for us and the, the sorts of people that we saw come into it, other than the really big donors, were new people. And so our challenge has been to keep that relatively large donor base on board and convert them from uh, an infrastructure project, which is very tangible. Uh, yes. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, cement and bricks and, and all of that. Uh, well, more than that, but you, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But to then move them across to say, can, you know, would you not, we've done that, but together, would you now like to support emerging artists yes. or First Nations? Yes or connections with Asia, or, um, you know, we have an artistic director's fund. We run five festivals, one that's aimed at uh, Asia Connections, Guitar Festival, Cabaret Festival, Kids Festival, and First Nations Festival. And uh, so each of those, most of those donors now have gone across to supporting one of those festivals. It's called 
the artistic directors fund. In other words, once they actually commit to it, uh, yes. then you know, the artistic director can use the use the proceeds accordingly. But that's very interesting that moving away from infrastructure and bricks and mortar to emerging artists and intangible uh, building capability in, in society as distinct from building a destination place. So thank you. What role do corporates play in supporting the arts? Because I'm assuming that was sort of more of a public or a, um, the intersection of both government and public money there. Corporates, how do they actually support the arts? Well, uh, some do uh, greatly, of course, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, I think, you know, it's more uh, these days, unless, of course, they're, you know, somebody on the board of, of a big corporate uh, or the CEO or the head of the PR department or whatever it is, uh, is particularly wedded to the arts or that there has been a long-term uh, history, you know, like the Rockefellers or something like that. Um, it, it's more difficult these days. And so I think, you know, many arts organisations uh, are really concentrated on private giving which in some cases, of course, has connections to, to corporates, you know, families, et cetera, are strongly connected, but it tends to be private giving. Nonetheless, uh, I think all of us are uh, working hard at, 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 at the corporate sector. Um, it, you know, it's not straightforward as it used to be perhaps 20 years ago. Uh, some corporates are, are associated with industries that um, are, you know, some patrons and artists uh, and politicians are not that keen on. In our country, of course, it's to do with uh, the resources sector, particularly yes. the things that are taken out of the ground. And, uh, you know, that comes with certain sensitivities. And I think it also depends, you know, where you're located. So in our case, Adelaide is, uh, you know, 1.2 million. It doesn't have a lot of head offices. Uh, and so the, the sort of things that can be brought off with arts alliances, you know, with private banks and other things in Sydney and Melbourne, it's a much tougher proposition here. And the other thing I would say is, you know, with corporates, it's very much uh, these days a marketing PR deal, uh, usually. Not always, but usually. In other words, uh, we are, you know, the, I'm a corporate, I'm going to sponsor you uh, or a particular festival, a particular performance. So what do I get back in terms of, tickets, profile, entertaining, all of that. So it's a real quid pro quo, whether with a, usually with a donor, it's, you know, I want my name on it or family name on it or, or I want to be anonymous. Um, but that isn't the case usually with, with corporate donors. It's interesting because I have a passion for, for corporates in the sense that I've, I've sort of seen them the move from the CSR, the corporate social responsibility, through to the ESG, environmental social governance. And there's a real um, paradigm shift that can happen to, to actually get corporates to align their purpose with investing in society for the better of society. So the, so the CSR and the ESG has been more sort of transactional, looking inwardly within their organisations to say, well, how is our, um, uh, yeah, how's our manufacturing process or how is, how's what we're doing impacting society or impacting, um, you know, our, our interaction with society through to more altruistic um, vision of saying as a corporate, you know, it's our civic responsibility to give back and invest and build healthier societies and, get involved in projects which aren't necessarily aligned to our um, uh, manufacturing or, or um, you know, purpose of being, but certainly from a, a values point of view, what their purpose is as, the, as a player in society. So, yeah, corporates are um, a very interesting topic. Um, but, yes, if we can get more corporates investing in the arts and, I guess, taking their place in society of, of building that civic infrastructure, um, that would be fantastic. Um, it takes, I think it takes a lot of work and it depends where you are. It's, you know, previously coming from Hong Kong, running the Hong Kong Arts Festival, you know, we had people like Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, Standard Chartered, uh, Deutsche Bank, you know, Mercedes Benz, um, you know, on, on uh, you know, AT&T. And, um, so, you know, big companies were centred in a, an international uh, world city like Hong Kong. Then uh, it's very different. It's a very different proposition from the arts company, from a cultural company, you know, 
working with boards and individuals in those companies because they, they want different things. So, yeah, it, it's that thing of trying to understand what a corporate wants and sometimes trying to lead the corporate, as you say, it's up from beyond the purely transactional to something a bit above that. Yeah. Um, so you touched on Asia. Given your time in Asia, what commonalities or differences exist between the, the arts funding models in Australia and Asia and what can be learned from them? Well, I always think with, with uh, Asia, uh, people and organisations tend to have a much longer term view, uh, not always, but often uh, than perhaps we do here. And because so much of our arts, uh, you know, arts uh, firmament uh, uh, revolves around government funding and, you know, we, whether it be state or local government or, uh, or federal and uh, and these governments, because of democracy, you know, change uh, reasonably regularly, even if it's even if it's changed within one party. So, um, you you know, there's a there's a shorter term focus, unfortunately, I think, in some respects. Uh, but you know, Asia it's hard to generalise because Asia is a very big place, and uh, so you know, the differences between uh, Japan or India, you know, are abundantly clear. They're very different indeed. And I mean, there are some countries that I think um, uh, clearly uh, their the government funding is paramount. Uh, China, uh, Taiwan, uh, whereas places like South Korea and Japan are really an amalgam of um, you know, private sector uh, involvement, uh, uh, commercial approach uh, with culture in terms of you know, making sure box offices ticking over well. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and involved with the private sector, I think, you know, if you look at something like um, uh, South Korea, their, their, their industry, uh, arts industry and entertainment industry, uh, 30, 40 years ago, they, they decided that they really wanted to be uh, a, a force in Asia, uh, maybe internationally, but definitely in Asia. You can see it now in K-pop, in uh, uh, TV, screen, certainly in drama, uh, dance, uh, symphony orchestras, believe it or not, and on and on it goes. Uh, but, but, you know, there was quite a lot of commercial impetus in, in that as well. But also, I think, uh, uh, a very strong view of successive South Korean governments that arts and culture uh, was fundamental to nation building and, you know, cohesiveness uh, of good civil society. Uh, I think in places, you know, like Singapore, Hong Kong, the arts have always been reasonably well supported by, uh, by, by governments, but they have been really big donors, both on the core and they continue to be big donors on the corporate side and, uh, you know, private individuals. Particularly, I think, you know, a sense of commitment amongst Chinese societies in terms of the value uh, of culture, whether it be, you know, visual arts, music in particular, uh, sitting alongside giving to hospitals. It's never either or. Um, I think, uh, you know, India is very much a commercial market. And um, so a lot of involvement uh, from uh, commercial entertainment companies uh, in, in arts. But uh, I think uh, the long-term view uh, that, that I see in places like uh, you know, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, Japan, uh, different in Indonesia, very different in Indonesia, but those, those other centers, those other nations, uh, a very strong commitment to uh, the place of arts and culture in the total firmament of their communities. You know, it was interesting after, uh, so I was part of the um, uh, group that, you know, as far as tourism was concerned, it took over after 1997 uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, so it's essentially, you know, Hong Kong government under Tung Chi Hua. But, you know, there was work done prior uh, to the handover with this uh, government, that, with this group of people who were about to take over Hong Kongers. And, you know, they had something like about eight or nine points as to uh, what should be the fundamental ingredients uh, for retaining Hong Kong 
uh, as a world city, international city, up until the middle of this century. And so you had things like logistics hub, services hub, uh, making sure that the international exchange stayed in Hong Kong didn't go to Shanghai, et cetera. But, you know, one of them, uh, one of the pillars uh, was a, a, a creative hub for East meets West. And, uh, you know, they were really dedicated to that. You can see the kind of money that went in to West Kowloon Cultural Centre and other things that they were doing. But they, you know, they understood very clearly that this was a serious uh, a serious fundamental for a great community. And, um, you know, I think that's admirable. And you can see it in a number of other uh, approaches, I think, particularly South Korea, um, Singapore even, you know, really has embraced this whole notion of uh, a contemporary Singaporean culture being very much part of that city's reputation. And it's interesting you talk about government because in Singapore, for example, government incentives are far greater to attract family money, family foundations and the like, and, and that sense of giving to build society as distinct from Hong Kong, yet Hong Kong has a nice um, mixture of, of uh, both Western and uh, uh, Chinese culture. So, yes, it's, it's interesting drawing those parallels between the two and the way that both government and private enterprise and even corporates intersect to support uh, those organisations, those cities. Um, what advice, Douglas, we're getting down to the tail end of this, so thank you very much. You've been a, a perfect uh, interviewee. What advice would you give to philanthropists who may be wondering um, how to have the best or greatest impact uh, with their support of the arts? Well, I, I, I think, you know, it's really to uh, allow people like me to, uh, to talk uh, uh, to uh, whether they're corporates or whether they're... Um, uh, whether they're individuals, uh, to, to reach out and, and uh, try and engage. I think uh, if, it, if it's something uh, that in, interests them or just, just to give arts and culture a chance. I mean, there are some people uh, who we work with who 10 years ago uh, would, wouldn't, wouldn't have come near us and mm -hmm. wouldn't have even thought of it. Uh, but after discussing uh, possibilities, you know, whether it's supporting uh, some of the, for instance, Adelaide is a UNESCO a city, for, creative city for music. It's the only one in this country. And um, uh, there are a number of projects that we have moving under that banner. And certainly, the, you know, the UNESCO branding uh, or, or accreditation, kudos, whatever you want to call it, has enabled us to reach out to people that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have considered uh, what we're doing. But um, you know, we have a big regional program that, uh, that works out, uh, out of our guitar festival, which goes to uh, country towns all around the state. And that's something that has interested one person in particular who is from uh, rural areas and feels that the rural areas have not been served well as far as the arts are concerned. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, education is a big one. I think uh, uh, when people, some people have started, you know, have had a passing interest in what we do, and we've got to know them better. And what, again, another philanthropist, philanthropist in particular, has been very interested in the fact that we, you know, prior to COVID, and we're starting again, we take a number of interns, uh, arts workers, and arts colleagues uh, from organisations in Asia, from Hong Kong, from Korea, from Japan, China, India. Uh, from Singapore, and that's something that uh, somebody has been quite interested in and didn't understand that we were involved in those international uh, connections. So uh, I, I, I would say whether it's, you know, whether it's performing arts or whether it's visual arts or whether it's screen or museums or, in fact, all areas of, of the arts, uh, you know, a, a, a philanthropist has... Uh, a um, just a passing interest or you know kind of curiosity uh, you know reach out or, or try and find out more because you might be surprised and I think that uh, people in our position are always eager to tailor something uh, a project which will meet you know, a philanthropist needs either short term or very long term I mean 
going from here today, I'm about to have a discussion with a philanthropist who has put uh, uh, considerable support towards an arts leadership intensive course for mid-career arts workers. And that'll start this year and it'll involve people from rural areas, but also colleagues from Asia Pacific. That's a long-term vision that he now has uh, for developing yeah. that, and we have. So, you know, uh, from small things, sometimes bigger things grow. Oh, and that is fantastic. Moving that dial from from just programs and shouldn't say shouldn't say just from programs um, to, as I say, building capacity and capability, and build, supporting the the arts enterprise uh, with you know building that up and, and indigenous arts and rural communities was fantastic. The, the work you're doing is fantastic, Douglas. Thank finally, you. finally, the Adelaide Festival Centre celebrating its fiftieth anniversary this year. Any particular favourite shows, programs? Uh, that you think the public should definitely not miss? Well, uh, on June the 2nd, uh, we will uh, have an anniversary concert. That was the night that it opened 50 years ago when our then uh, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam and State Premier Don Dunstan, both of whom were great supporters of the arts, and this was the first capital city arts centre in our country, they opened uh, uh, our, our main theatre. And so it was a huge occasion. Uh, there was Beethoven Ninth and all of that, uh, which was great. But for this 50th, we're going to use artists to showcase our five festivals, which we think are in you know, very important areas. First Nations work, um, our connections with Asia, Cabaret Festival, which we've been famous for for, you know, for 20 years, uh, our work with kids, with Dream Big, and then a UNESCO uh, City of Music favourite, which is our guitar festival, which is run by Australia's best classical guitarist, Slava Gregorian. So on that night, we'll be showcasing uh, great young artists from those five festivals, which I think in a nutshell will say this is why mm. uh, the uh, Adelaide is Australia's uh, UNESCO City for Music. That's fantastic. Well done, Douglas. You know, congratulations on putting together a program for the 50th anniversary. And can I say, as someone who lives in Adelaide, I look forward to attending some of those events and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Adelaide Festival Centre. Look, that wraps up our interview. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank you from the Global Philanthropic Group for participating today, because it's a fantastic series that we're undertaking here with the Global 20. And what you've wrapped up today in terms of looking at the arts, philanthropy, and particularly the Asian-Australian connection has been really worthwhile. So, Douglas Gautier, AM, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Lincoln, for the opportunity.